Hello, JS Congress. I'm so excited to be with you this afternoon. Hopefully you all are refreshed from lunch because we're going to dive into some really meaty technical topic right now. But first, by a show of hands, do you work on a web application? OK, great. As I expected, almost all of you. And that's awesome because I, too, work on cool web apps, or at least I think they're cool, and that's how I pay my bills. And I'm willing to bet that the applications that you work on are made up of a bunch of different components or widgets because that's the architecture of most modern web apps. The application I work on follows the same pattern. But it does something unique as well. It actually makes a bunch of different data requests for each of those components, so much so that we often run into this issue where JavaScript is single-threaded, right? And so what happens if you're making a lot of requests or having to do a lot of processing on that data on that single thread? Well, frequently this. You get loading spinners that are just twirling around and around and around. And then if they keep going for long enough, they just stop. Your site freezes. And then maybe it totally crashes altogether. And your users are getting frustrated and angry. And then sometimes they just rage quit. <laughs> right? But I wish that this was an uncommon problem. But it's so prevalent that there's basically an entire subgenre of internet meme devoted to talking about slow websites. Now, I realize that web performance is a very complicated topic, and I'm by no means an expert on every facet of it. But there's one part that I find particularly interesting and is going to be the focus of this talk today, and that is how do we ensure that numerous large and or slow data requests are not impacting the experiences of our users? And there are many approaches to answering this question, but one that we found particularly helpful in the application that I work on is to use web workers. Web workers allow us to handle data, re data requests, process data, and even just sit there and wait for slow servers, all without ever blocking the browser's main thread, which leads to a better experience for our users. And that's wonderful. But they're not exactly the easiest construct to work with. Their API doesn't follow the same patterns that most modern web frameworks use, which can make it a bit challenging. So in short, they help us out, but they also complicate things a little bit. And so today, what I want to talk about is how we can weave together webs of web workers. And what I mean by that is I want to discuss some patterns and strategies that we can apply to make working with web workers easier, so that way we can maintain our code bases over the long haul while still delivering a great experience to our users. Now, as was mentioned before, my name is Trent Willis, and I'm a senior UI engineer at Netflix, where I work on internal tools. And we deal with a lot of data, like Netflix-scale data. It's tremendous. And this little guy is called Spidey, and he's going to be popping up throughout the presentation today to help highlight and underscore points that I think are important, things that you should probably remember and take away from this talk. So let's start from the very basics. What is the Web Workers API? The Web Workers API allows web applications to spawn background worker processes running in parallel to their main page. In essence, it brings multi-threading to the web. And this is a really, really powerful concept, except, interestingly, the API is not that verbose. It's pretty limited. You start by simply creating a web worker using the worker constructor, and you give it a file path to load. Calling this will create what's known as a dedicated worker. And that stands in contrast to a shared worker, which will actually be able to be used by more than one page. A normal worker can only be used by one page at a time. And so we're going to focus on those today because they're a bit more common and a bit simpler to understand. Now, the interesting thing is when you load up a worker like this, it's going to load that script at that file path you gave it into a new thread. And so you can actually think of them as kind of like script tags except for loading another JavaScript file into the browser's main thread, it's loading it into a new thread. And so that's awesome. This is all you need to do to run some JavaScript in a web worker. But that's not very helpful, right? Because your application, your user's experience is actually all running in the main thread. So you need some way to communicate between the two of them. And so the spec allows for workers to communicate with the thread, with the browser's main thread, through a message passing mechanism which are basically just like events, if you've ever worked with native JavaScript events. And so for those of you that might not be familiar with that or might not totally understand what that means, we're going to walk through a quick example. So in the main thread, we have our worker that we just created. 
And on that worker, we can call a method called post message. And you can pass in some data. That data can be basically any JavaScript object, with a few exceptions. Most notably, you cannot pass functions. What you can and cannot pass is governed by what is known as the structured clone algorithm. In essence, what this does is it clones the object from the main thread and recreates it in the worker thread for you. And so, once you have sent that data in, you can then focus on the worker side of things. And in your worker, you have access to a global object called self. You can essentially think of this as the window object for your web, web worker. And on that object, you're going to want to add an event listener. And you listen for message events. And then anytime you get an event, you will have the data that was passed in available under a data property. It's pretty straightforward. And at this point, you can do whatever the heck you want with this data. It is now in a separate thread, and it will not impact your user's uh, experience in any manner. And so that's awesome. And whenever you're done with that data, or you want to send an update back to the main thread, you simply call post message on the self object. This works exactly like the other post message method, except it goes in the opposite direction. And so you can probably guess how we then get that event. We add an event listener onto the worker object. And then, same as before, you access the data under the event's data property. Now, honestly, that's pretty much it in terms of the common web worker APIs that you're going to run into. The only, other, the only other one that might be worth mentioning for this talk is the terminate method, which, as you might guess, terminates a worker instance. It frees up all the computing resources that have been allocated to it. And so if you're no longer going to use a web worker, call terminate, because they will run indefinitely otherwise. So if the worker API is so simple, is so minimal, then how does it cause problems? Why does it complicate things? Well, there are four main issues that I see developers encounter when they start trying to use web workers. The first one is knowing when a task is complete. Right? You initiate a task in your worker by posting a message to it. But you then get updates or know when that task is complete by receiving just generic message events. And so if you start having multiple different tasks that are being performed, or getting multiple different types of update messages, it quickly becomes kind of hard to know when the thing you're interested in is actually finished. Furthermore, this gets even worse if you have multiple worker instances going at once. You have all these different workers, different types of messages being passed around, and if you want to chain some of those events together, you quickly wind up with this tangled ball of spaghetti code. And it becomes really hard to debug. And trust me, I have experienced this firsthand. And unfortunately, this is all only compounded by the fact that workers are kind of difficult to test. They don't follow a lot of the same patterns that we're used to using when testing other types of code, because you literally have to context switch between different threads in the browser. And finally, there's no way to dynamically define workers. And so if your build system isn't set up such that you can easily split out separate JavaScript files to load up into the workers, you're going to run into some issues. So that's that for the four main problems I see developers encounter when working with web workers. And I actually think that this is hindering their adoption somewhat. But there are solutions to all these problems. They're solvable by building on top of the tools that the web platform is already giving us. So let's talk about those. So for our first problem, knowing when a task is complete, the web platform actually already has a built-in feature that lets us know when things are done. And if you can guess what it is, it's pretty common. It's promises. Our strategy here should be to turn those message events into promises. That way, we no longer have to worry about invoking and finding out when our task is complete in separate areas of our code. Instead, we can kind of encapsulate them. We can write a helper function like this post message helper that actually takes in a worker and a message, gives you back a promise, and says, hey, I'll send this data to the worker, and when I get a message back, I'll resolve it for you. And then you can start to use it like this. And you get your invocation and your resolution of that task all in one line. And this becomes even nicer if you use the async await syntax, because it makes it look synchronous and a lot easier to reason about. And so the helper that I just showed a little bit ago is a kind of naive version of this library called Promise Worker from Nolan Lawson. It's really great. And if you want to start using web workers, I would recommend you use a strategy like this. But if we move on to our second problem, how do we then manage and coordinate multiple workers without it tangling up our code base? 
Well, again, use promises. As shown, it automatically reduces a lot of the complicated stuff that we normally have to set up. But further than that, start using methods that look like normal functions in the main thread. And what I mean by that is provide an abstraction that more or less looks like any other JavaScript class or function that you're interacting with in your application. And then you can just apply the same strategies and patterns that you're using throughout the rest of your code base. So as a quick example of what I mean by that, let's look at an example where we have three workers. Our first two workers are focused on making back-end data requests. They fetch the data and then do some processing on it. And so if we write a class around our worker, we want to expose a fetch method. And then once those have returned, we want to pass that data to our third worker, which does some processing on it. In that case, we want to expose a method called process. The goal here is to reduce the amount of coordination between all those message handlers we had, as well as making our code more clean and readable and easier to understand. And honestly, you wouldn't even be able to tell that this code is running in web workers if it wasn't for the names of these objects, right? A good abstraction for your web workers should look like pretty much every other part of your code base, except for their methods will always be async. And this is such a huge improvement over the default messaging interface that like, I think there's no reason to even try to use the other method. And so I would highly recommend you check out this library called Workerize from Jason Miller or Develop It. Uh, he created Preact. And this library will take an ES module that you've already defined, create a worker from it, and then give you back a promise-based API to invoke its methods by on the main thread. It's really awesome. So on to our third problem. How do we dynamically define workers? This one, interestingly, has a kind of widely known solution, at least in terms of web worker things. And that is, you create a worker from a blob URL of a function. Now, if you're like me, you're like, what the heck is a blob? Or it's been a long time since I've seen one of those. A blob is really just a file-like object in JavaScript that represents some data. That data can be a string. And if your string happens to contain some JavaScript code, that means you have a file-like object of JavaScript code. And so you can turn that blob into a temporary URL and then load it into your worker. And all of a sudden, voila, you have dynamic web workers. That's awesome, right? But remembering this whole song and dance and how to wire it up is kind of annoying. And so you can use another, another library called Greenlit, which is actually just a subset of the functionality that Workerize provides. So again, it's developed by Jason. And all you do is give it a function, and it'll give you back a promise-based function to use in return. So at this point, we've talked about three of the problems that I mentioned. We have one more, and that is testing. And we'll get to that in a bit. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about an app that uses these in real life, these strategies. And that is the app that I work on at Netflix called Lumen. Lumen is a self-service custom dashboarding application. We let users create their own custom dashboards by defining some JSON configurations and then small custom JavaScript functions to transform their data. And you can find more out more about it at the Netflix tech blog. But for now, all you really need to know is that for each of these visualizations that you see, there's the possibility that they have their own custom backend data source they're connecting to, or even multiple. And all, us as application developers have no idea what the characteristics of that API might be. And so we process all those requests, all those data sources in web workers to make sure it doesn't block the main thread. And we let them run their custom transform functions inside web workers as well by dynamically defining them. In short, Lumen performs almost all of its major data operations inside web workers. This allows us to keep the main thread free for user interaction so they can keep clicking on stuff, scrolling, no matter what data sources or custom transformations they're having to actually perform. So this is a real world, really critical application that uses most of the techniques that I've talked about so far. And before getting into talking about testing, we're going to detour a little further and talk about some more complicated things that you can do with web workers. Because a lot of what I've said so far is kind of basic, honestly. So we're going to talk about worker-to-worker -worker communication. And this is actually what inspired the title of this talk, because you can weave together a huge network of web workers by communicating between them. Now, why might you want to do this? Well, the reason is because sometimes you have a lot of work that could be subdivided, or maybe you have many small tasks, and web workers are still single-threaded. So it would be nice if you could 
you know, spread that work out a little bit if you want. And so there are two strategies to accomplish this. The first is to simply create another web worker inside your web worker. And you can just reuse the strategies we've already talked about, which is pretty great. But that means that your web worker is then having to manage all these other relationships. And sometimes that's not great, and it makes things hard to reason about. So there's a second strategy that you can employ. And that is to actually use what's known as a message channel. A message channel consists of two message ports. And essentially what they are, what message ports are, are just event emitters and event receivers. They're kind of like the post message method that you saw on the main thread and in your worker, except for they're not bound to a specific object or a specific context. So how does this work? Well, if we have two workers on our main thread and we want to send messages between them, we create a new message channel. We can then take that channel, take the ports on it, and post those into our web workers. Now, at this moment, you might stop and say, but wait, didn't you say that we can't send functions to workers? How are they going to be able to transfer data between each other? Well, you'll notice that we're passing them as a second parameter here, actually. And this parameter allows you to specify an array of transferable objects to post. And so a transferable represents an object that can be transferred between different execution contexts, like the main thread and web workers. So this is a very not widely used interface, but applies to message ports. And in essence, what it does is it doesn't copy them when they're going to a web worker, but actually transfers the object. And so when you post a port into your web worker, you can no longer use it from the main thread. Instead, you can only use it from the new context that it is in, unless you transfer it again. And so inside our worker, when we receive that event, we can check to see if it has ports associated with it. And if it does, we can take that port and set up an on message handler and a post, and then we can call post message. And then that data will go to wherever the other port is located. It provides a nice decoupling between the web workers having to know about each other. So this whole song and dance is kind of convoluted, but it gives us a lot of power. For instance, remember this example that I gave a little bit ago? Well, we could actually use message channels such that once the backend workers have fetched their data, they just pipe it directly to that processing worker. It never has to touch the main thread. So you can set up some really powerful, but also really complex and potentially even really complicated processes that never touch the main thread using these strategies. But that's not all that you can do here. We can go even further, such as we can use these strategies to render some non-blocking canvas graphics using the off-screen canvas API. Now, this is a standards API, but isn't widely implemented yet. It's available in Chrome and behind a feature flag in Firefox. But essentially, it lets you render stuff to a canvas context, like you would in the main thread, but inside a web worker, so you're out of the way of your users' interactions. But that's not all. We could go even further than that. Some folks over at Google have been working on actually allowing you to do non-blocking DOM manipulations. You can perform some DOM operations without having to touch the main thread. And so folks on the AMP project at Google have been working on this library called Worker DOM. And it's pretty awesome and very experimental, but the idea is wonderful. Right? What if you could do all of the computations in React and the virtual DOM and all that stuff inside your web worker. You no longer get in the way of the users. And then when you're done computing that stuff, you just transfer it back and then quickly render it. This would be incredible. So imagine this future, right? You're able to fetch data. You can process it. You could generate some lovely art or images from it and then render your application all without ever having to touch the browser's main thread. So if your user is currently looking at something, they can keep on scrolling, keep on interacting, and they'll never notice. So as an example of kind of putting these concepts into play, I put together a small demo of Conway's Game of Life. For those not familiar, Conway's Game of Life is a quote unquote zero player game where essentially you start with some inputs and then allow it to evolve over time according to some set of rules. And so in this first demo I put together, all of this is, all these computations are being done on the main thread. And it's really janky. Like the animations in the background are slow. When you click the button, it doesn't increment right away. And so this is just, it's not a good experience. But if we move all this stuff into a web worker and use the message channels in the off-screen Canvas API, you can keep on interacting with it even while it does these heavy computations 
and it's super smooth. Anyway, the whole point of all this is that you can do a lot of stuff with web workers, and more is coming down the pipe. So it's awesome to start experimenting and playing with this stuff today. But we're still left with one problem, and that is, how do we test them? Right? Well, hopefully, you can kind of piece it together now, right? If most of our strategies are to treat them all as functions, we're kind of left with two strategies now. The first is to start running your testing framework and your worker in the same thread. And I actually don't think this is a good strategy, but I have seen plenty of people try it. And in essence, what this means is you now either load your worker as part of a script tag and then run it like basically most of your other JavaScript code, or you do it in a worker thread and try to load your testing framework into the worker thread using the import scripts API, which we haven't talked about, but isn't really important for this talk. Both of these are not great approaches, in my opinion, because this is not how you are using your workers in your application. So what should you do instead? Instead, treat your worker as a function or a class, but oftentimes they're kind of like functions, right? We have some inputs, which are messages, and we get some outputs back, which are also messages. And so if you combine that idea with these patterns that we've talked about of turning your worker interactions into promises, it becomes much easier to write just normal function-based unit tests. So your tests start looking a lot like this. Right, it's just like you have your worker instance, you have some data, and then you post message that data, and then you wait for a res response to come back. It's pretty straightforward. But there is a set of caveats to this. Mainly, how do we mock or stub external calls in a worker? If your web worker is making calls to an external database or an external server, you don't want those running in a unit test. You need to be able to stub that out, to mock it out. And unfortunately, this isn't an easy thing to do. So I made a package to help with it. It's called WorkerBox. And essentially, it allows you to inject some code into an already defined worker so that you can properly stub or mock or make any other modifications that you need in order to properly test that web worker. Now, unfortunately, I know this name is actually very similar to the service worker package called WorkBox, but I named this before I was aware of that, and I don't really want to change it now. So now there's a lot more that I could talk or say about testing, but really that's the gist of it. Anything, any other advice I have would kind of be just generic testing advice. And so if you want some examples or demos to play around with, you can take a look at the test that I actually wrote for that game of life demo at the same glitch URL and then just add slash tests at the end of it. So just apply the patterns that we've talked about so far and then write your unit tests. And then if you need to mock some stuff out, try using worker box. So that brings us to the end of this talk. I hope by now you've seen that web workers are powerful. They enable us to do some really incredible things. They let us get so much work off the main thread and out of our user's way. But you should probably avoid using them directly. They're not exactly the easiest thing to work with, and they can make your code base really difficult to maintain over time. Instead, stand on the shoulders of giants. Look at the patterns that others have used before and have found success in. Use libraries that make it easier to work with web workers. Apply these in your application wherever it makes sense. So there's no better time, really, to get started with web workers than today. I do not see them nearly frequently enough, I think, in web apps. And so if you could apply some of the stuff you've learned today, I would be tremendously happy. That's all for me. Thank you.